Hello everyone, this is Sirius Trivia, and welcome back to our Siege of Hefei series as we continue with the second Siege of Hefei in the year 215. Now, although it seems to be a long gap between the first siege in 208 and the second siege in 215, there was definitely no peace in between this time period as Sun Quan's first failed attempt turned Cao Cao's attention fully to this area. In January of 213, Cao Cao would personally lead attack from the north to assault the military harbor at Ruxukou. And while Hefei was the fortress guarding Cao Cao's southern flanks from Sun Quan, Ruxukou was the northern military installation guarding the northern flanks for Sun Quan. Yet in 213, Cao Cao's army was able to break through the defenses of Ruxukou and capture its commander, Gong Sun Yang, alive. But after seeing Sun Quan's naval defenses farther south on the Yangtze River, Cao Cao promptly accepted Sun Quan's plea for peace and retreated. It was also after this battle that Cao Cao made the decision that we mentioned in our previous episode of forcing the migration of civilians living in this area between Hefei and Ruxukou, as he felt their farmlands could easily become supplies for Sun Quan in future campaigns. But unfortunately, this plan backfired, as over 100,000 civilians would end up fleeing farther south to join Sun Quan, as they simply did not want to uproot from their ancestral homeland in the south to move north. It also didn't help that Cao Cao had a much harsher Tun Tian policy in terms of the requirements for military service and farming output when compared to the more lenient policies in Sun Quan's territories. But in the end, Cao Cao did achieve his goal of creating this no man's land in between the Huai and Yangtze River, but it did come at a great cost, as the loss of over 100,000 civilians was not something that can be ignored. It also created this awkward situation for Cao Cao, as now in this area, aside from the city of Hefei, only the city of Wan is still populated. But without support of the surrounding villages and farms, the logistical issues for these cities became heavy burdens on Cao Cao, and this was especially the case for the city of Wan as it acted as an outpost of sorts for Hefei, given its geologic location being farther south of Hefei. And Sun Quan would exploit this weakness in May of 214, when he would launch an attack on Wan City with Lu Su, Lu Meng, Gan Ning, and Ling Tong. And before Zhang Liao could come to rescue the city, the city would fall, as its garrison commander Zhu Guang, along with 10,000 civilians, were all captured and taken south to become citizens of Sun Quan. Now, in response, Zhang Liao, who had been sent south to defend Hefei after putting down the rebellion led by a local named Chen Lan, started the construction of a brand new southern outpost for Hefei as they needed some sort of warning for future attacks. And fortunately, just two months later, in July, Cao Cao would come himself to launch yet another southern campaign against Sun Quan, which would give Zhang Liao enough time to complete his outposts. But sadly, due to the questionable death of Xun Yu on this campaign, Cao Cao would return north without any military actions while leaving behind Zhang Liao, Li Dian, and Yue Jin with just 7,000 men as his attention shifted westward towards the Hanzhong region. And this is where our series connect with our Hanzhong series as Cao Cao will soon launch his first Hanzhong campaign against Zhang Lu. Just when Liu Bei and Sun Quan was about to go to war with each other over disputes in the Jin province. But with news of Cao Cao's imminent arrival in Hanzhong, Liu Bei would come to agreement with Sun Quan over the distribution of the Jin province as he would rush back to the Yi province to prepare for the Hanzhong campaign. This turn of event left Sun Quan with a prime opportunity to take Hefei as the majority of Cao Cao's forces, along with pretty much all the possible logistical laborers available to Cao Cao, shifted west. Hefei was truly alone, with just 7,000 defenders, with no hopes for reinforcement of any kind. So in August of 215, with the late summer tides at the highest point, Sun Quan would launch his most ambitious and largest invasion ever, with a combined force of roughly 100,000 troops as they would sail up to the front gates of Hefei. Now this 100,000 troop represented everything Sun Quan had, as he had no defensive concerns at this time. As you can see from the generals that participated in this battle, there were Lu Meng, Gan Ning, and Ling Tong. 
who were all part of the Western forces for Sun Quan in charge of the Jin Province borders with Guan Yu. But due to the recent treaty with Liu Bei, Guan Yu was no longer a threat. So the Jin Province forces all returned to join in on the Hefei attack in the east. Aside from the Western forces, Jiang Qin and He Qi, who had always been stationed in the southern regions fighting the Shan Yue, also participated in this siege which meant that the regional Shan Yue threats were also no longer serious for Sun Quan after years of developing the south. And lastly, the roster of generals also included old-timers like Zhou Tai, Chen Wu, Pan Zhang, Song Qian, Xu Sheng, Ding Feng, Zhu Ran, Zhu Huan, Quan Cong, and Han Dang. And since Sun Quan's army largely used a retinue system, where each general was in charge of a set amount of private troops, the large roster of generals pretty much confirmed the troop numbers and Sun Quan's determination with this campaign. Unfortunately, this campaign will go down as an example of higher the expectation, the harder the fall, as Zhang Lao and his 7,000 defenders would not only hold on to the city of Hefei, but also come dangerously close to killing Sun Quan himself. Now let's talk about how exactly this happened. As Sun Quan's army was approaching, Cao Cao had actually sent General of the Guard Xu Ti, to come to Hefei, with a pouch labeled, Open when Sun Quan arrives. So when Sun Quan's army arrived, Zhang Lao, Li Dian, and Yue Jin would open this pouch containing the secret plan, which stated that when Sun Quan's army arrives, General Zhang Lao and Li Dian should lead an offensive attack outside of the city, while Yue Jin and Xu Ti must stay inside, no matter what happens. Now, this strategy did have a solid reasoning behind it, as Zhang Lao and Li Dian had a rough relationship stemming from the fact that when Zhang Lao was still working under Lu Bu, his forces had actually been the ones who were sent to Li Dian's family village and raised it, because Li Dian's father, who ran the local gang, was an adamant supporter of Cao Cao. So, drawing from a similar historical example of city defense failing during the Warring State period, when the general who remained inside the city had a grudge with the officer sent outside, as the general inside oftentimes kept the door shut or refused to reinforce as they wanted their comrade to die. Cao Cao avoided this by sending Zhang Nao and Li Dian out together and keeping Yue Jin inside. But there was no farther details about the plan of attack, as it only offered this macro idea of how to fight the battle, as Cao Cao wanted to shock and awe Sun Quan's army. So it was up to Zhang Nao to technically make the details of the attack, and he was worried that Li Dian would not listen to his command. But Li Dian quickly assured him that when it is the matter of state, their personal issues take a back seat. So that night, Zhang Nao picked out 800 of his best troop as they would slaughter cows for a final dinner, as Zhang Nao felt a midnight raid targeting Sun Quan's main camp on the first night of Sun Quan's arrival would give them the best chance of success, as no one would expect such a smaller force to be dumb enough to launch an offensive night raid. So precisely for that reason, Zhang Lao and Li Dian, along with the 800 riders, rode out silently after midnight as they charged straight for Sun Quan's main camp. And sure enough, completely caught off guard, Sun Quan's main camp soon fell into disarray as troops woke in the middle of the night to fend off Zhang Lao's raiding attack. It also didn't help the morale when General Chen Wu came over to assist Sun Quan and was promptly killed by Zhang Lao. Then General Song Tian and Xu Sheng came over next, but were both injured and disarmed by Zhang Lao. And it wasn't until Pan Zhang would arrive and escort Sun Quan farther south towards a hill that the situation in the camp was stabilized enough to allow the much more numerous Wu forces to form multiple encirclements on Zhang Lao's raiding party. But Zhang Nao was just getting started, as he would soon lead a dozen or so riders to break through these encirclements to the east. But just as he broke out, the remaining troops yelled out to him, asking if he was going to abandon them. And Zhang Nao would answer with his action, as he and his dozen or so riders would charge right back into the encirclement, as they would fight on until a big enough gap was created to allow the remaining men to all break free and race back to the city of Hefei. And this entire fighting sequence took so long that by the time Zhang Lao and Li Dian fought their way back to the safety of the city, it was ready past noon on the next day, as Sun Quan's forces were left dumbfounded at the amount of damage inflicted on them 
by such a mere eight hundred men led by Zhang Liao. General Chen Wu's body was collected and mourned, as those who were injured, such as Song Tian and Xu Sheng, now retreated back south to nurse their wounds. And for the next ten days or so, a stunned Sun Quan made no efforts to launch any siege attempt on the city, as the morale of his forces had tanked following this initial attack. And to make matters worse, disease started to spread in their main camp, and a decision had to be made soon about the campaign. As a massive army also meant massive amounts of daily food consumption, and after mulling his options, Sun Quan would order his forces to retreat, as he worried a forced siege under this condition would yield nothing but more casualties. Well, there is nothing inherently wrong with this decision. The manner of the retreat being carried out was extremely questionable. Now, from where Sun Quan made camp outside the city of Hefei. There was a small river to his south, separating his forces from the main waterways of the Shu River, where his naval forces were parked. And while there were several bridges over this small river that the army could use to cross, the closest bridge to Sun Quan's main camp was quite obvious and obviously well known by Zhang Liao's forces, who knew the local terrain. So, observing this retreat from the city walls. When the remaining Sun Quan forces number less than ten thousand, Zhang Liao decisively ordered Li Dian to take a small force of cavalry to race to the back roads to the bridge closest to Sun Quan's main camp and destroy it. Then Zhang Liao himself would take the bulk of the remaining forces to launch another direct assault on the remaining rear guards of Sun Quan's forces. Except this time, he would be the one with the numbers advantage. And what is unbelievable here is that of the small group of rear guards remaining outside of city of Hefei were Generals Lu Meng, Jiang Qin, Ling Tong, Gan Ning, and none other than Sun Quan himself, who somehow boldly or foolishly volunteer to be the last one to leave Hefei. Unfortunately, his display of bravery would turn into disaster, as Zhang Liao's pursuit would shook. The Wu forces, as Sun Quan quickly sent messengers to call back the forces that already retreated south of the bridge, but by the time the messengers arrived at the bridge, the bridge had already been destroyed by Li Dian. Now trapped, Sun Quan's forces awaited death as the mere sight of Zhang Liao struck fear into them. Luckily, Gan Ning was able to snap them out of their fear, as he was decisive enough to quickly order the signaling crew to strike their drums, to signal the army to attack. As he and Ling Tong threw themselves at Zhang Liao's men, then after emptying his quiver of arrows, Gan Ning quickly retreated back to Sun Quan's side as he would escort him to the broken bridge. And this is when Sun Quan's advisor Gu Li would recommend Sun Quan to jump the broken bridge with his horse, as Sun Quan grabbed onto his saddle while Gu Li raced behind, whipping Sun Quan's horse as hard as he could to drive the beast to make this jump that would save Sun Quan's life. Then slowly, the remaining forces, including one thousand of Sun Quan's elite Tiger Guards, Gan Ning, and other generals, swam across to safely leave Ling Tong and his retinue behind. And Ling Tong, who was not super highly ranked at this time, only had three hundred retinue to his name, and they would all fight to the death here, as Ling Tong would be the last one to swim across at the end with a body full of wounds to rejoin Sun Quan. Touched by his contribution, Sun Quan comforted him on the loss of his troop, as he promised him to double his retinue cap to six hundred men following this battle. And with this, Sun Quan would escape the second siege of Hefei, as the most lopsided battle of Hefei would end with Zhang Liao not only victorious, but also famous amongst the Wu forces to the point where mothers in the south would use Zhang Liao's name to scare their babies to stop crying. So hopefully you all enjoy this episode, and I'll see you all next time. Bye.